Billy Strains uh, sitting here talking to you in my shed and uh, not being able to see anybody. But uh, anyway, that's the way it is at the moment. Now then, Chris, how are you doing? Um, as usual with me, I can't do these things without uh, uh, without a little bit of feedback. It makes me feel very strange. Yeah, hi guys. Um, hi Pete, how are you doing? Um, so I'm I'm really hoping that throughout you'll ask lots of questions, and um, you'll also um, respond to some stuff. Um, you know, so that we can uh, we can tailor the the presentation and the and everything else to you. God, loads of people. Derek, hi. Um, Pete, Richard, Jane. <laughs> yeah, not so bad. Chris, yeah. Colin, Andy. Uh, it's great. Anyway, we should crack on, I suppose. Um, just before we um. Just before we get into the uh, the presentation itself, just to remind uh, remind some of you that perhaps haven't done this before, we do occasionally um, some people um, saying that they can't um, they can't operate various aspects of the um, of the software. So uh, there's just a little uh, reminder of, of what you can do to uh, to make things go a bit smoother. So full screen is always good. Um, you can move the presenter's um, camera around. You can move me around the screen. So if it covers up part of your screen, you can move that around. Um, and um, remember, if you want to ask a question, then you can flag that up with the little button at the bot bottom there. Um, or comments. To be fair, they, they both kind of come up the same, comments or, or questions. So um, really, it, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, use the raise your hand thing but um hey you know we'll, we'll find out what happens to that but also some some people have said that um if you um that they can't see the comments but so, um apparently um in some cases you need to move the um this chat chat bar sidebar across so that you can see the comments because that's uh, that's useful in this case um okay so what are we going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes? It'll probably be slightly more than 40 minutes um, in the end with questions and stuff. But we, if, if you all start sloping away, then I'll uh, I'll realise that I've overstepped the mark and, uh, I'll, and I'll finish at that stage. So a quick re recap from last week. Was it last week or was it or was it the week before? Time Time's a bit strange at the moment. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about a couple of things that we talked about last week, just very briefly. But the, the main two things that we want to talk about is um, how to centre in, in thermal lift. Simply, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, and, yeah, as I say, they're using all the available tools, the various sensations of lift and how that comes about. Um, and also a little bit about the turbulence and the feel as you approach the thermal. And as I say, I really would appreciate it if you guys can i've had a quick look through the attendees there and there's a few experienced guys on there as well so if you fancy um uh, just speaking up on the on the chat there that's great there's also the chance that if somebody's got a really good idea or i think i'm talking absolute rubbish um then i can open your microphone and you can talk to everybody as well it's risky uh, but uh, but but we can make that happen um i think we're all friends we're all glider pilots so hey you know um let's, let's see what happens um and also yeah how to thermal with others safely and that's something that um i think there's a few misconceptions around so hopefully i'll be able to bust a few of those misconceptions um very briefly um that's me i've always been a glider pilot um i've always um I, I, I love gliding. Um, I am. I do fly power as well a little bit, but um, I always um, end up in places where I think, oh, I wish I was in a glider here. And those are, those of you that know me well will know that if there's any flying on offer, then I, then I'll take it. Um, yeah, I'm not keen on sitting on the ground when I can be in the air. So uh, yeah, slightly frustrating at the moment, but hey, um, uh, yeah, same boat as everybody. Okay, quick recap. So we talked last week about um, getting away from a 
uh, from a lower launch, so a winch launch or a lowish aerotow. Um, and we talked about the fact that, um, let me just change this thing to a pen. The fact that when you're down low, you need to really be looking, especially if there's a cloud street like this, you really need to be looking at the new thermals that are forming on the up sun side. So you're looking at probably more at the ground than at the sky. And you, you're trying to grab these these first bubbles that are coming off the ground before they um, before they end up, you know, discrete bubbles that you can't climb underneath. So that was the um, that was some of the stuff from last week. We also talked a little bit about varios and how we can use the vario and vario lag to help us. And we'll, we'll come on to that a little bit more in a minute. OK, um, so. We need to talk about thermal thermal centering. And actually, these slides um, are very old and um, they, they come from the soaring course, which I believe Simon Adlard wrote many years ago. So thanks very much to Simon. I've been using them ever since, modifying them slightly as we as we've been going along. Um, look out, look out before you turn and not during. So actually, and actually in these modern times when we're talking about human factors quite a lot more, when we're on our way to a likely looking cloud. So say say we're on our way to this this nice looking dark cloud or up, or up by a cloud base. And we're, we're on our way towards that cloud and we're thinking about what, what we're gonna do when we get there. We need to prepare ourselves to take that climb. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on at the beginning uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we're trying to, what does it mean the status has been changed? Well, never mind. Um, <laughs> so there's an awful lot going on as we approach the thermal, and as we start to start to turn, we've got a um, well. Hit me with some of it. What 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 are we doing as we as we start to turn in this thermal? What are we monitoring? Come on, give give us give us some replies here. Yeah, we're looking at the sensation. We're looking at the speed. We're monitoring speed, the feel of it exactly. We're looking inside at various things. Your string, quite right. Angle of bank we're trying to look out as well the attitude yeah we're keeping the attitude constant the vario of course other gliders yep so we're actually and gusts yeah we're listening to things as well um and our position in relation to the cloud turning gliders yeah and who else is in this thermal so and a careful study of the cloud quite right and the airspace yeah so we also trying to worry about whether we're climbing up too close to airspace as well so there's there's an awful lot of stuff that we're that we that we're trying to monitor as we get close to this cloud so on the way we can do things like looking at the map and thinking right if the cloud base is at 5,000 feet so if i climb up to cloud base is the airspace still going to be okay where i am so we can look at the map or our of course our moving map in the glider and um, we can have a good look out as well before we get there because if if we're running along with somebody else or somebody else coming into this cloud from a different direction we can monitor what they're doing and and kind of try and pre-plan how we're going to join this thermal and of course we're going to talk about joining the thermals in a little while so and especially if we're getting low as well we can do things like have a sandwich have a drink have a pee you know we can prepare for all these things if we're getting low maybe we're getting close to an atz or something like that we can tune the radio on the way to this thermal where we're going to be really busy so it's a kind of workload management thing we try and manage our workload so that when we get to the when we get to the thermal underneath the cloud we'll have the the opportunity to take to use all our um concentration to actually thermal in the most efficient way that we can so it's not just looking out um it's it's loads of stuff as we get towards the thermal and then as we approach the thermal we 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 brushed uh, we kind of touched on this last week we we need to look up especially if we're if we're not just um off the launch if we're up by cloud base or you know a thousand or a couple of thousand feet below cloud base on a really good day where we need to look up 
and make sure that we're underneath the cloud. So if you well, I did this did this last week and I feel a bit silly doing it, but if we if we look up, we look up comfortably at about 70 degrees or something like that. So if we're a long way below cloud base, if we look up at 70 degrees, we 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 might we might look at the cloud and think, oh, we're underneath the darkest bit of the cloud. But we're not actually. We're not there yet. How many times has somebody, you know, have any of you guys been with instructors or really good, um, perhaps cross country or soaring pilots who have said, no, no, don't turn yet. We're not there yet. Or, we, you know, you've look, looked up and you thought you're underneath the darkest bit of the cloud, but, you, but you're not actually there yet. Um, I think it, it happens reasonably often. So look up and make sure you are actually underneath the cloud. Look up vertically. Um, strain your, your head right back and it also allows you to look around for other gliders while, while you're doing that um yeah as we get as we approach the, the thermal what are we almost hoping to encounter as we as we approach the best bit of the cloud what what are you guys saying sink absolutely yeah so you get, you get lots of sinks appearing on the right here. Yeah, so we're, we're hoping to encounter sink and we're hoping to encounter, exactly as these guys are saying here, some cobblestones. So some, you know, rough and bumpiness. So you might get smooth sink on the way to the thermal, um, on the way to the dark bit of the thermal. And then you might get some turbulence as, as you get there. And very often, as we covered last week, People will turn before they get to the thermal because they look up and think they're underneath the cloud. They're in sync. They think, well, there's no there's no lift here, so I need to go somewhere else. But actually, they need to wait because sync is actually a good sign. Sync's excellent. That is following the the model of our thermal. So we get towards the the, the cloud. We get the sync. We get that outflow. And we talked last week about um, the, the false vario lift that we can get. And just to recap that for, for any of you, I've got my, my, my vario set up here with my very long tube and my total energy tube, and lots of you have seen me do this before. Um, just to prove that vario lag is not the, the thing that, that a lot of people say it is, if I blow on my tube, um, if you'll ex excuse the expression, you'll hear, hear me blow, you tell me how long it takes to for the vario to, to re register. I didn't actually see that. <sighs> yeah, there we go. It's pretty instant. And so, as we discussed last week, that means that if you get an instant, um, an instant reading of lift on the on the varios, and um, you also feel lift at the same time, that is probably a function of air being blown at you from the thermal. So it's actually the the a horizontal gust because the, the gusts will increase from the wings and it will increase the, it will re, reduce, oh, where's my camera? It will reduce the pressure behind this tube and suck, suck air out of the system and it will show lift. So if you get lift, if you get the indication of lift and the feeling of lift at the same time, that's a gust, it's not a thermal. If you get that sensation, that nice gentle rising sensation followed by a smooth indication of lift on the barrier, then that's a good thing. That's probably a thermal, and you should start turning. Um, and actually, I should have put this this slide up while we're talking about that. But we covered this um, in a bit more detail, so I'm not going to go into that too much. So, um, What did I just say there? Let's have a look. Uh, thermal size. Uh, actually, we won't go into too much detail just at the moment. Obviously, if the thermal's big, then we can describe larger larger turns turns with less less angle of bank. If the thermal's small, then we need to turn tighter. But it's a trade off. When should we turn? That also depends on what we think the thermal size is. So, if thermals get bigger as as they get uh, as they get higher in general. Um, 
and if they're a very big cloud if there's a big very big cloud above you then there might be a very big area of lift but that's probably a different subject but the key thing is when to turn it's as soon as you stop accelerating and we talked a little bit about this last week again so if we're coming along towards the thermal in this direction so this is our track which you guys you guys um, stop my pen when you think the best acceleration will be felt in this thermal so if i'm coming along in the glider here press return when you when you when you think i'm at the best acceleration i've got one stop now <laughs> if this works <laughs> yeah it's actually somewhere here isn't it because we're going from minus eight to minus two in quite a short period um so we might start turning um at this point here and we'll actually be turning oh, it might be a bigger turn than that but um we might actually be turning back out into the sink again but of course if we carry on in this direction we'll feel a big surge here yeah i might just change that to red so we get this big surge here and then as we go along a bit further the surge kind of reduces but we're still feeling uh, and upward acceleration now what i want you to do now is tell me to stop when you think that excellent that feeling of acceleration is going to disappear right so the acceleration will stop somewhere like this because once we cross this point then we're going to be in a in a region where the the sink is going to start to, um, sorry, it, we're going to feel like we're, we're starting to go down. Yeah. Um, but of course, at that point where that, that acceleration feeling stops, we're actually in the best lift. So it's at this point that we should turn. And that's why this slide says you should turn as soon as, as, soon as you stop accelerating. Hopefully that kind of makes sense um so at that point we're going to turn so we're in a glider let's try and get rid of some of this stuff so we're in our glider and we're gonna let's pick orange which way are we going to turn and how do we know which way we're going to turn what do you reckon wing lift yep yeah. Left wing goes up, lifting wing, yeah. Your string, ooh, Chris Gill, you better tell us more about that, I should think. Um, the winglet lifts, yeah. So, which way, so it's gonna try and turn us, and in fact, it's, it's pretty mean, really, because the thermal is gonna try and turn us actually away from the lift, if it had its, if it had its own, its own way. And yeah, um, the direction of, of other gliders quite right we, we've got to turn in the direction of the other gliders and i'm glad you said that simon but um in this case we're on our own so we need to go against that lifting wind don't we so we need to turn left and take our way into this thermal and by some miracle we've ended up describing this fantastic turn or as good as i can do it with a mouse in my shed um in in the thermal so we're, we're in the middle there excellent um how many times has that happened we're in the middle of the climb and we go up like a like a rocket no problem at all happens all the time doesn't it um one thing that assuming that we are in the best bit of lift here we're going to talk about um centering if 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 we're not in the in the best bit of the thermal in a minute um hopefully people have seen one of these before um, and it just proves a little bit about how steeply we need to turn or how tight we need to turn um, so this is a a turning polar for an unballasted ls4 
which is convenient because I've got one of those. Um, not always unballasted. But what it shows is the bank angles, oops, here, and the optimum speeds to fly for those bank angles in a turn. Oops, you know, I'm probably making it worse. <laughs> anyway, so these are the optimum speeds to fly at, in this case, so 46 knots is the optimum speed to fly. Uh, with a bank angle of 40, 40 degrees, 43 knots is the optimum speed at 30 um, uh, degree ang uh, angle of bank. And if we draw a generalized curve across those kind of, they're, they're kind of um, individual polars for each angle of bank. What we get is an, a relationship between the speed that the glider is sinking at and the turn radius that the glider describes. So just like the fighters, um, just like any any kind of, you know, Spitfire or whatever else, they have a maximum turn radius that you can see here. So the maximum turn radius for, us, for our unballasted LS4 is about, you know, 50 odd meters turn. Um, but of course, when we're turning at 50 odd meters radius really tightly, because we have to turn tight, we're also coming down quite fast as well. So, unfortunately, there is a trade-off between the angle of bank that we're turning and the speed that we're flying at, and um, how how much we can get the glider into the middle of this thermal. Because obviously, the tighter we can make the, the glider into the middle of the thermal, the better we're going to climb, because in general, the best rising air is kind of concentrated in the middle of a thermal. So the conclusion to this is that it's very rare that you should turn at 20 degree angle, a 20 degree angle of bank, because actually it doesn't it doesn't cost you very much in sink rate to turn at 30 degrees, even if the thermal is huge. If you've got a massive, great big thermal that you can do massive, lazy turns, it, you shouldn't really be turning at 20 degrees. You need to be turning at at least 30 because it doesn't cost you very much. Um, if you want to increase your turn radius to a reasonable amount that, that is a, a good compromise between the sink rate and the radius of turn to keep us in the middle of the thermal, then you need to be turning at about 40 degrees. And that is true for most standard class and, well, most most gliders, actually. Now, um, what I probably should have done is, is given you some indication of how you know that you turn at 40, 40 degrees. Well, for, for those of you that fly Shemp Earth gliders, you'll note that the, 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 co the combing for the instrument is something like this. Oh, that's a terrible drawing. Anyway, it's got a flat bit at the top, a bit that's an angle at the side and a bit that's an angle down the down the bottom. And in general, if you line that bit up with the horizon, that's about 40 or 45 degrees or something like that. Additionally, and I'm not suggesting that you spend your whole life doing this, but if you look at the instruments in the glider, there's four screws, unless you've got an LX9000, you've got lots of money. Um, and of course, these screws here are at 45 degrees to the, um, you know, to, to normal for the glider. So if you, I'm not suggesting that you spend your entire entire life turning with kind of going, uh, is that about 45 degrees? But just to calibrate your own feeling about what is 40 or 45 degrees, take those diagonal um, screws, uh, with your hand and kind of offer it up to the horizon whilst keeping a good lookout, of course. And um, you can probably just about um, do that to, to, to let you know that you're turning at about the right bank angle. Because 40 or 45 ish degrees is about the optimum for most flyers. Okay, any questions so far on that? Um, We've got a few people type, typing.
will move on in a second to turn in the wrong way. Artificial horizon works fine in the LX9000. Yeah, it's a good point. If you've got the horizon on, I've got Janus and in the front seat, the horizon is calibrated. So yeah, that's that's a good. Uh, uh, how do you get the optimum speed for a specific glider? Some gliders have um, turning polars published. Um, do you know what? I don't know how you work out a turning polar. It's a good point, um, but it's it's one to uh, to ask around for, I guess. Um, but even even ballasted up, these I mean, you have to fly a bit faster. But even if you ballasted up, then you even at forty degrees, you have to fly a little bit faster. But the sink rate is still well; it's a little bit more with with ballast on board. But it's still the optimum because all these all these figures will will make you sink a bit more with the with with water on. Um, I was on calculator over the optimum speed. Uh, never seen this. <laughs> Uh, what determines the optimum speed? Is it just the stall? Yeah, it de it depends on the glider that you're flying. Um, I mean, in the LS4, it, it probably stalls at about in the in a 40 degree angle of bank. It probably stalls somewhere near 40 knots, or slightly less perhaps. So we're talking, you know, about six or seven knots higher, and that sounds about right to me. If you're flying, I mean, you'll you'll notice. In the um, oh, oh, no. there we are. I'm flying the LS4, and how fast am I going? About for 51 knots, because it, it doesn't actually make that much diff, that much diff, dis, difference. But if you look, my screws are probably <laughs> roughly. Well, it's a bit of a hazy day, but they're, they're roughly lined up with the horizon, I guess. Um, not that I was trying, but anyway, they are. <laughs> um another question there yes exactly steve yeah um so ruth yeah i think um i think if you if you stall if you get your gliders onto the buffet in in the in your 40 degree angle of bank and then add you know seven or eight knots you're probably somewhere close to the optimum speed i would say don't spin it obviously <laughs> well you can spin it if you want but uh, make sure you're nice and high um uh, let's have a look. What are, the, what are these little solid curves? Radius versus speed. They, uh, yeah, I don't know. These are, are little little polars, I think, for each for each speed and, and bank angle. Um, yeah, I must admit, I'm not sure I, how you construct one of these. I probably should have worked that out before I did the uh, did the chat. Um, Chris Gill, is it worth talking about your string position in a turn? yeah some gliders again you'll notice here that my yaw string is very slightly um out of the turn and um certainly for shemp gliders like and, and definitely the discus b in my experience if if you fly with the string absolutely right down the middle of the, the canopy you're holding off the aileron about you know a quarter a quarter of alien tra travel right it feels like that it might not be a quarter but anyway you, you've got some pressure on but if you put a little bit of out turn rudder on just a tiny bit just that much it it removes all that all that pressure from the ailerons and it just feels right um now some people have said that well the air's you know, describing a curve around the glider, so there's bound to be a difference between the middle of the pressure of the glider and the and the front of the glider. But I'm not I'm not sure about that really. I think it's more to do with the differential in airflow over the wings and stuff. But I think you should do whatever feels right. But you should definitely not have in turn string, in turn rudder, um, because that is very inefficient in a um, in a thermal in turn would you say that's about right uh chris or do you want to uh i can open your mic for you if you want <laughs> uh what else have we got on the other that's nine thousand and i've got shows ready to turn oh cool never i don't think i've ever flown with a nine thousand um news gliding not even solo so be gentle i don't understand on the graph why 60 degrees is the speed 
it's the speed lower at 56 stalling. Uh, I don't understand. Let's have a look. Yeah, you've got to fly at 56 knots in order to keep the, the glider flying. Um, because at six degree angular bank, your stalling speed increases by this. What is it again? I should know this. <laughs> I think it's the square root. Oh, God. Somebody tell me. 1.4. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's 2G, isn't it? At six degree angular bank. So, um, so yeah, you've got to fly faster, otherwise it'll stall. And of course, if you get really close to the stall, then the induced the, the induced drag increases hugely, and you really do start sinking then. So yeah, hopefully that um, answers that question. How are we doing for time? Thirty minutes. Oh my god! Right, we better crack on. I think. Um, why do some gliders seem to go up better sometimes when the speed is higher? Don't know. LS sevens like that, isn't it? But I tell you what, I've flown with some some LS sevens flown by some people that have flown uh, that have been flying them for a long time, and I fly a, a paper bag LS four when it's empty, and they can maybe it's just me being a bit rubbish, but they can climb just as well as I can. So I don't know. Um, some gliders just need it. It's, I don't know something to do with aer aerodynamics. Flaps, flaps back. Uh, how about gliders with flaps and best flaps setting? I suppose that probably is. Um, yeah, flaps is a different subject, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, I don't want to spend too long on that. However, you flaps m allow the wing to produce lift. Uh, they change the shape. They essentially they change the shape of the wing so that the wing is most efficient. Yeah, at providing lift at high speeds and at low speeds. So, can you, if you imagine you sat there at 40 odd knots in my Janus, go around and around and around, trying to make the thing climb as best as possible, uh, then you want a nice curved wing section to produce lots of lift at low speed. But when you're batting along at 110 knots in the Janus on a really good day, full of water, you want the wing to be as straight as possible. You don't want this curved thing that's producing lots of drag at that speed. You want something, you want the trailer there to be out of the way because you don't need the extra lift. The lift, the, the wing's producing loads of lift. The, the, there's loads of air going over it. So that that's a, a quick explanation of why, why you put the, the flaps down in the turn because you need a nice curved wing to give you that, that, that radius of turn and the extra lift of, uh, as you go around. Okay, let's move on. Move on, otherwise we're going to be uh, I'm going to be really late. Okay, it might be that you turn the wrong way. How many people have done this load? So you, you you're chugging along, and you're thinking, oh, here we go. Oh, which way shall I turn? Which way? Which way? Which way? Which way? Doesn't matter. You just got to turn. Just turn. God's sake, just turn. So you turn, and then the variable goes, no, you know, and it all drops off. Now, in the LS4 you might be able to turn in the opposite direction. However, by the time you've recognised what's happening, you're probably here somewhere. You're going to turn this way, and by the time you've got the, the thing rolled over, and the LS4 or the LS7 or something is so quick in the roll that, that you might be able to get it back around this way. But, hey, you, you're still going to be pretty much out of the thermal. It doesn't work. The best thing to do is, and this is one of the one of the times, you know, your instructors have probably told you, oh, I'd speed up in speed up in sync, slow down and lift. Yeah. So you speed up in sync, slow down and lift. No, that's quite right when you're flying straight. But in this situation, let's get rid of some of that rubbish. No, oh, damn. Dots mean that I've got to press the button a lot. <laughs> oh, it won't get rid of the rest of it. Uh, do this right uh, draw okay so if we're going if we're going to turn back towards the, the lift we recognize that we've turned the wrong way because the the, the bottom stops stop falls out of the bottom of the glider so we turn and we turn even when we're in sync we turn as tightly as we possibly can even though we're in sync, because we know that we're trying to turn back and we slow down. 
So we slow down and turn to get back as quickly as, as quickly as we can to the best bit of the lift. So as it says here, as the lift feeling reduces, the maximum uh, maximum the glider is turned. A pronounced sinking sensation as the glider flies into sinking air, and the ferry will probably register sink probably by the time we get here somewhere. Keep turning for 270 degrees and then straighten, uh, spelt wrong slightly, um, for up to two to three seconds. So yeah, turn as tightly as you can, get back to the lift. And this is why, this is what we're going to talk about in a minute, why it's so important that you map out where the thermal is in your head um, in order to centre this thermal. So we turn back towards the lift and then we turn in the same direction again. We don't turn the opposite way. We turn back in the same direction. What's that, Mark? Bernard Ecke says turn less than 270 degrees because you have gone too far and need to go back a bit. Well, maybe, yeah. Depends what happens here, doesn't it? Maybe you'll end up out here, so you turn a bit less. I go with that. That's fine. Although 270 seems to work pretty well for me. So if you turn the wrong way, don't try turn, Try reversing the turn. Keep turning, turn as tightly as you can, get back to the lift, and then use, use your thermal centering that we're going to talk about in a second. Okay. Um, so we can... Oh, where's the other thing? Right. We can centre using the th using the Vario. But what we've got to realise, as we talked about last week, is that the Vario um, lags behind the actual lift. It only lags because the glider's got mass. So we've just we've just seen that when we blow over the thermal, um, blow over the, uh, the Vario, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty instant. So it's actually the mass of the glider. So if we're flying a K8, which has got a huge um, wing area and um, not that much mass the Vario lag is less than it is in the Janus for instance because even though the Janus has got a bit more wing area than the K8 it's probably not that much more it takes a lot more time for the glider to be accelerated as we turn and that's why a lot of people certainly in the 80s and 90s um, well yeah, in my case, anyway, went from K8s and stuff like that up to Astiers. And Astiers got this terrible name for being concrete swans and all the rest of it. And I think part of that is because people are used to thermaling um, K8s and things. And the, the Varia responds a lot faster in a K8 than it does in the uh, the old the old Astier because it's got a lot more mass and a bit, a bit less wing area. So... Um, how should we centre using the using the varia? Well, this is an idealistic. Hopefully, you can all read this. I'm not going to not going to read it all out. It's an idealistic kind of thermal and an idealistic um, scenario for using the the varia. Um, but actually, what we need to do is use our bum, the, the sensation of of lift as well as the Vario. So if we imagine we're in, we are in this, this thermal in turn here, when should we open out the, the, uh, the turn? So we're going around the turn. I want you to, to say now and then press return when I'm at the right, at the right point. <laughs> so we're coming around the turn. When do, we, what, when do we ideally need to open it out? About now, yeah, exactly, brilliant. So we need to open, open it out here. So what will we be feeling at this point? We will be feeling um, as an acceleration. I think we will, won't we? We'll feel the acceleration here. And, we'll, and that acceleration has probably just started because we've, we're in fairly steady kind of sink here. And the acceleration has just started. So when the acceleration starts, then we should probably open out the turn a little bit. And then as the acceleration stops, which would probably be about here somewhere, then we should start turning again. That'll put us in the middle of the thermal. But what is really, really important and what, what a lot of people in, in my experience don't have is a sense of um, 
a sense of uh, spatial awareness of where they are and where the thermal is. So when I'm coaching and when I'm trying to coach people on on thermal centering, I will keep asking them to point at the thermal where they think the, the middle of the thermal is. It's over there. Now it's over there. Now oh, I'm going off the camera. <laughs> it's over there. Now it's over there. And now it's over there. And now it's over there. And I'll keep asking them to point to the, the middle of the thermal. Even if we're not centered, just keep going around two or three turns and point to the middle of the thermal all the time. And if you do that as a solo pilot, you'll get used to the, this awareness, this spatial awareness of where you are. And that's what you need to work on, in my in my view. You can read up all sorts of stuff about, you know, how, how the how the thermal is messing you about and how the outflow works and the various indications from instruments and all the rest of it. But actually, if you use this technique of, yeah, you, you need to use the vario in conjunction with the feelings that you get. So if you get to this point here where, you, where the acceleration stopped and the vario is, is coming up past zero and starting to rise again, then that is really good news because the vario will lag behind what you're feeling and it's very likely that you'll, you'll get lift on the vario. And it means that you're in the middle of the thermal when you start to turn. So, uh, but the, the absolutely main thing to do is to map out the thermal in your own mind and keep when you solo just keep pointing at where you think the thermal is and if you get confused keep working at it um the th keep your speed constant keep the angle of bank con constant even if you're not in the middle of the thermal yet just keep going round and round and round and work out where the middle of the thermal is and then you i mean there's loads of techniques out there like um Oh, tighten up in the surge, open out in the surge, do, do you know, there's all sorts of advice. But and and they all the trouble is they're all right and they're all wrong because it depends on on the on the situation. But at the end of the day, if you can feel the surge and you feel that surge and then the surge disappears, you're in the best bit of lift there, and then you can you know that I've just flown through the best bit. And if the varia show, confirms that a couple of seconds later, then all you need to do is manoeuvre the glider so that that bit of the sky is, is in the middle of your turn. But that takes a lot of awareness of what's going on around you. Um, use the audio, absolutely. Ground references, yeah, absolutely. I should have, I should have said that actually, Teddy, absolutely. So you use ground references to um, maintain your view of where the middle of the thermal is. Um, you can use the, um, the thermal mappers. I, I use the thermal mapper on the LX7000 um, just to confirm what's going on. It's all just more information than on the UD and stuff. The UD thermal mapper is probably better if it's connected to a total energy vario though because otherwise it's just going to be using the GPS. Um, I don't, I've not, I've not flown an S80, so I'm, I'm not sure, Pete. Um, okay, let's move on now. Um, any questions about, about centering? I, I, I know I haven't really given any magic bullets there, but I, I do think that to, to keep yourself, to, to give yourself the best chance, there's these kind of almost scientific kind of principles that you can use, like the acceleration stop. That's that's the best bit. And if that's confirmed by the various sometime later, then, you know, that that you've just flown through the best bit. Map that out and make sure that that you, you put that bit of sky in the middle of your, of your turn. Many thermals are oval. How do you deal with them? Oh, as best as you can. <laughs> Issues around joining the thermals with us. Yeah, we're going to go on to joining thermals with, with others now. Okay. So, um, lots and lots of people. I realise that we're, we're we're running over slightly here, but I think I think we'll we'll, we'll be okay here. Um, I'm pretty new to gliding. I'm not sure I can even recognise the surges. 
Yeah, I mean, in in that case, let's just move back to the Vario. Then you can train your bum by using the Vario. And some thermals are very smooth and you can't feel them very well, but you'll, but you'll get better at it. And it's, I mean, you can just use the, the, the Vario, as in this diagram here, to, to map out your thermal. And it will get you somewhere near, but you'll probably be describing kind of almost a, you know, if you just use the Vario, you'll end up doing this and, and things. Um, how do you deal with the increased G when transitioning from 80 knots between thermals to 45 knots in it? You shouldn't be pulling too much G. Um, yeah, you pull a bit initially when you change the direction of the glider. But then as soon as you've pulled a little bit, and then pointed the glider up so that, they, so, that they, so that the trajectory is reducing speed, then you shouldn't be pulling too much more. I, in, in competitions, when you see people pulling up and pushing over and pulling up and pushing over, you invariably beat them. If you, and, and you can't feel what's going on if you're pulling up and pushing over all the time. So you you need to be really smooth yeah you still need to be pulling up gently in the lift but pull up gently and then allow the glider to to kind of point its you know allow the glider the, the the speed to wash off as you as you've pointed the glider up and feel for the thermal if you're doing this all the time you you'll never feel anything and you'll you'll end up um well you might end up crashing into somebody as well <laughs> um yeah be smooth smooth and cautious and uh, what's the word you know try and try and yeah try and map out the thermal okay let's let's talk about um joining others in the thermal and um, again in, in my experience that lots of people don't want to join other other gliders in a the thermal uh, because they're, they're scared uh, and quite rightly um you you've got to know what you're doing if you're going to join a, a a glider in another thermal and the key thing to it is to knowing how you can position yourself around the turn so i'm just going to show you a little video um and some of you may have seen this um of, uh, of me with actually pete gill who's who's on here in the other motor glider um position ourselves or i was positioning myself with with pete um, and let's let's see how that looks. So hopefully you can all see some of this. Okay, so here we are in a thermally turn with uh, with another aircraft. Um, you can see the other. Hopefully you can see the other motor glider there. Um, and we're pretty much matching our bank angles. Um, he's got about 30 degrees angle of bank on, as have I. If I increase my angle of bank, we should start to catch up with his tail. So you can see there that we're encroaching on his tail, which means that, you know, he will start to lose sight of us in a second. You can see that he'll start to lose sight of us pretty soon. If I take some bank off, he will start to come round and encroach on our tail. And that's how you position yourself around in the turn. You can see the the other guy there, hopefully. And he's slowly going round to the other side of, you know, we're, we're opposite him now. Keep a good look out at the same time. And now, because we've got less bank on than he and he's got, he's starting to come round towards our tail. And the correct thing to do in this case, I don't know if you can see him there, hopefully you can. And the correct thing to do, he's going to start disappearing behind our tail in a minute. The correct thing to do is to increase our angle of bank. So if we actually increase our angle of bank, he will start to come back round onto the opposite side of the thermal wing turn. And you can see that happening now. Hopefully you can see the wingtip of my motor glider. Now 
and he's almost back round now. We've only increased the angle of the bank a little bit, kind of five, five or ten degrees, but now here he is back round on the other side again. Now if I take some bank off again, he will come back round behind us. You can see that happening now. And what a lot of people do in this situation, because they start to get a bit uncomfortable with the position of the other glider, you can see that he's actually pointing at us now. Yeah? So he's going to start to go around behind us in a second. And we're starting to worry. What they do is they speed up. So I'm not going to do anything to the angle of the bank, I'm just going to speed up. You see, immediately we lose sight of him behind us. I don't know if you can see that, but we've lost him now. So the only safe thing to do is to look under the upper wing, make sure it's clear, and roll out and run away. <laughs> That's the only safe thing you can do in that situation. Okay. I think I was about to say, okay, where's the airfield and can I get back? <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Pete. I've used that a lot <laughs> over the years. Let's go back to the presentation. So um, that's the video. Actually, um, I was going to put this survey up um, beforehand, but it'd be quite interesting to do it now. So if you guys could answer these questions for me. Um, based on what you've just seen, hopefully you can you can see the uh, the questions now, um, and I'll I'll stick the the results up. So you're in a thermal with another glider. That glider starts to disappear behind you, exactly as we've just shown here. And you start to feel uncomfortable. He's he's behind you, and you you're worried about it. What should you do? I'll just give it a f another few seconds. Yeah, we got some comments as well. So increase bank, run away like a girl, get out of there. Yeah. So if I, um, that'll do. Um, 64 of you voted, apparently. <laughs> um, if I end that and then share the results. Um, now, I wonder if some, I, I don't know if anybody would dare to admit that they, that video changed their mind about the way this works. Because in my experience, when I'm flying with others, Quite often, they, especially if people are behind you, they they tend to speed up and think that that's going to increase that distance between them and the other glider. But actually, it doesn't. It it has it. And in fact, if you speed up, it has the opposite effect. It increases your radius of turn and reduces your angular speed, and it means that the glider actually come comes around even more. And that's the most common problem. Um, obviously, if you're worried at all, then you need to get out of there. Um, and um, and you do that by looking under the upper wing to make sure the gliders that, that might be behind you is not there, and that they haven't decided to, to leave as well. Um, once you've done that, you can very gently roll out and, um, and speed up and get out of there. Um, but actually, if you want to... Um, to try and resolve the situation, then you actually increase the angle of the bank of your glider. And that's really what this slide is trying to show here. So this is the ideal situation when you're in, the, in, in a thermal. If you're catching them up like this, what should you do? So this is, this is you, and um, you're catching up with the tail of the other, the other person. What do you reckon you should do to resolve that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mark, Harry, uh, Richard, Richard, um, decrease, reduce bank. Yeah, level up a bit. Absolutely, widen the turn. That's right. So reduce your bank angle. Now, if you've got the most timid pilot 
find the K8 with 20 degree, degree angle of bank, especially if in the, in the middle of a some kind of, yeah, dagger, 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 yeah, exactly. If you're in the middle of some kind of, you know, hardcore competition, it can be very frustrating. But of course, what is, what is really tempting to do is this, to tighten your turn up. The trouble is, at this position here, and this, this diagram doesn't show it very well, you are going to be banked to the right um, to a, you know, to a large bank angle. That means that from about here to probably somewhere here, you've lost sight of this guy and you won't see him. What's to stop this person increasing bank thinking, oh, I'm not climbing enough, or I think the thermal's over here. They're going to increase bank. They won't see you, certainly not in this region here as, you pa as you're passing them, because they won't look up like this. They'll never do that. They won't see you. And if they increase bank, and you, you're, there's no way you can see them, if you increase bank at that, uh, if they increase bank at that stage, they'll crash straight into you. And you'll never, you'll never know what hit you. Well, you will. <laughs> You'll kick yourself that you, you shouldn't have turned inside that other person. So never, never, never turn inside somebody else. Unless there is a huge margin and there is absolutely no way that that person could get to you, knowing that that you, you can't see them. It is, a, it is a really bad idea. Now, the easiest that one of the ways that you can sort this out is to get on the radio and say, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so, um, do you mind if I turn inside you? If they say yes, then then, then crack on. Hopefully they've, they've got you and, and you trust them, but still a bit dodgy. So this manoeuvre of turning inside somebody because you get frustrating is a very bad idea and you shouldn't do it unless you're really sure from, from radio contact that they've got you in there in, that they can see you and that they're looking out for you this is a scenario that we that we've just looked at in the video so in that case we need to obviously um, increase our angle of bank and obviously this guy can increase his or her angle of bank to get out of your way if, if, if they're getting uncomfortable but very often in these situations both people both of the the, the the guys are getting uncomfortable um, but actually, as you saw in the video, you can um, maintain your position by increasing and reducing bank angle. Yeah, Steve, hope certain comp pilots are listening. I am not convinced that everybody understands this, even in the nationals. <laughs> um, or if they do, then, um, I, yeah, I wonder how that how they're implementing it but anyway i probably shouldn't say such things um but that is the method now the best thing the best way to practice this is obviously it'd be great if you could do it with an instructor so actually join thermals be proactive and join thermals with other pilots and try and um uh, and, and, and position yourselves around the thermaling turn I, I do it if i can when i'm coaching ah yeah let's go and join that person I mean, I'm a bit of a loner, really. I, I, I like thermaling on my own and doing my own thing. But certainly um, it can be, um, a, you know, obviously, um, if somebody's marking a climb and they're the same height as you, it would be nice to be able to join them and be confident in your ability to maintain position. Now, just one more thing before we go to some questions. Um that all assumes, or this all assumes, that you're already in the thermal with the, with the other person. But sometimes you'll be trying to join the other person at the same height. So you crack on, and it wouldn't it be nice if just as you join the thermal, um, the other glider was, was on the opposite side uh, of you and you could just join. But that never blooming happens, does it? So what we need to do instead is to adjust our angular speed, if you see what I mean. So if we describe a bigger turn, and we could, we could actually go further around this turn, waiting 
for this other glider to end up on the opposite side. So if this is us here, we wait for this other glider to be on the opposite side to us, and then we match that glider's angle of bank. And if we match that glider's angle of bank, we should stay on the opposite side of the thermal. But at that stage, we know that, um, well, we know what to do. We've just been discussing it, haven't we? So we know what to do to maintain. And if you give that other person a lot of birth, so go right around, you know, kind of many wingspans away from the other glider. Um, make sure that they know that you're there. You could even wait. I mean, ah, that's the other thing. If somebody waves at you when, when you're thermaling with them, then wave back. They're, they're not just being friendly. It's also a method by which they know that you've seen them. So if they, if they wave at you, you should wave back. Everybody knows that everybody's seen each other because quite often it might, I join thermals and I see the other glider and they surely can see me, but then they do something really weird. And I think maybe they didn't see me at all. And that's why they didn't wave back. <laughs> so, yeah. Also, of course, you can call them on the radio and say, I've got you, no problem. I'm just going to go around the outside and I'll join you on the opposite. No problem. Awesome. Why not use the radio? If possible? OK, uh, I've got one question here. We can go to questions now. Uh, can you talk about what to do when they, who got to the thermal first, put in a centering correction to the to main to maintain station i should mimic but that potentially throws me out of the thermal i should mimic their correction right or wrong when i get to where they did it um yeah it's i guess it's a it's a game of etiquette to a certain extent isn't it um personally if somebody's doing something weird in a thermal that i don't agree with Quite often you'll be in the thermal with somebody else and it's obvious that they're not in the middle. And you, you go around and around and you're thinking, it's over there, it's over there, come on, move. And they'll move and then you move and that's great. If they move when you're in the middle or they move away from where you think the middle is, I'll just go and find me a thermal. Now, it's easy, it's easy to say, isn't it, if there's other thermals around and you're not too low to do that. But you've you've got to... You know, you've got to be show some etiquette in thermals, especially if they were there first. I would say, if they were there first, they do something weird. I would just get out of there and find my own thermal. If I was there first, hopefully I'll be the one that's moving the thermal around. Be patient. Everyone has to learn. Exactly. You know, it might be the the, the club. Um, uh, you know, newly solo chap trying to trying to do uh you know half hour or one hour and they're in and out of the thermal like mad you're flying 300k and you're getting frustrated well tough <laughs> and if you see someone not doing so well off as fly with them give them some advice on the ground exactly brilliant yeah any other questions about anything else that we've we've come we're coming up well we're over an hour now Can you talk about what the audio area is showing as you into the thermal? Same as the mechanical one. Um, the, the only difference between audio or electronic barriers, some of them have got fancy accelerometers and all that kind of stuff in them. Um, but really, the only difference between electronic and mechanical barriers is the time it takes for them to re return back to zero. They generally respond to the lift. At about the same time but it's always best to listen to the keep your eyes out of the cockpit and listen to the mechanical the audio area if you get a surge in the then you know that you're accelerating upwards if that's confirmed sometime later by the audio area then you know you're onto a good thing and that's what i look out for if you as i said before if you get the surge and the vario reading at the same time that's a gust and you shouldn't turn hopefully that answers your question what else have we got um what if i climb climb somebody yeah i mean you've got to 
you've got to make sure that you you've um you you give the other person enough um clearance so i'm not going to put a number in it but it needs to be a reasonable amount so you don't so you don't you know pee them off if you outcline them and you you know a couple of wingspans higher than them um i mean it's too close for a lot of people i know lots of people club pilots who who won't who who work reasonably happy if you're on the opposite side of the thermal um and you know maybe a couple of hundred feet above or below but as soon as you get any closer than that then they're not happy so you're going to push them out and nobody wants to do that so again etiquette make sure that you're not annoying the other person get hold of them on the radio make sure they're happy you know use the radio more as glider pilots we should definitely use the, the radio more uh what we got when's the, ne the best time to exit the thermal um when you can see oh this is another subject when you can see that there's better a better climb ahead that you can reach safely with options that's the definition so as soon as the thermal starts to uh, thermal um starts to reduce or even if you're in a reasonable thermal but the sky ahead looks amazing and you can get there safely um with a couple of options then you should go um these sessions are great surprise <laughs> yeah quite right maybe we should have been doing them all along is last week's presentation yeah it's on youtube um can you share the slides including last week's it's all on youtube so you can um so you can use that um obviously i, I don't really want to just share the slides themselves because there's there's not a lot on the slides it's all to do with the interaction and you know all the chat that we're having so but yeah this is being recorded yes it is so i'll put it i'll put it on youtube as soon as i can after this it might not be immediately after because i'll have to trim it a bit and stuff if i'll get to the end massive thanks oh thanks very much richard and instructor wants to describe be climbing up faster than thermal in the middle of the crowded thermal can this ever be safe no not not really because you're turning your back on everybody so it's it's like we were, we were talking about before wasn't it where where was that no oh, that's gone spidery now where was it that one yeah if you turn your back on on this guy he can't see you you can't see him you're gonna crash sooner, sooner or later um how much flam does farm help in thermals well it, i guess it if you if you're looking at other gliders it can tell you how fast the other gliders are climbing and that's what happens in comps a lot i hate it but hey there you go what frequency should we be on yeah 130 105 is the usual frequency this kind of standard frequency but of course we've got a lot more frequencies now so yeah it's not it's not great but maybe we should maybe we should start a movement where you know um and if this is diana i didn't just say the gliding movement then by the way um maybe we should start a movement where if you're in a thermal and you you you're with others then we should be on 131 or five um if you can get a word in edgeways of course is anyone monitoring the previous events on youtube to answer questions mm, no <laughs> sorry can you say a word about differences between standard compensating and net of areas? Oh man, that's a big subject, uh, Marco. Um, standard area is exactly the, the, the kit that I've got here. So it's the diagram that we showed, I showed earlier. That is a bog standard total energy compensated variometer. Ah, you said standard and compensated. So if, if this wasn't compensated, and that would just go out to static okay and when you pull the stick back you're doing 80 knots you pull the stick back the pressure reduces the air flows out of the capacity through the flow meter the vario and out to out to um, the atmosphere but the compensation means that that the as you pull the stick back the pressure behind the pipe is reducing due to the ambient pressure but because that hole this hole here is behind the um, the tube. The pressure actually increases a bit because you're reducing speed. 
and that compensates out for your for the stick lift so that's the compensated variant netto variants have a little leak in them if it's a mechanical one or it's done electronically if it's an electronic vario and it will tell you it should tell you what the air mass around you is doing so as you slow down it should subtract the sink sink rate of the glider and it should just tell you what the air is doing all the time and they can be really useful when you're flying especially in wave cross countries because you're flying fast all the time you can't really rely on what the the the, the, uh, the mechanical vario is telling you the the best type in my view is a super netto vario because as you slow down that actually continues to compensate and the super netto tells you what the glider would be climbing at if you slow down to the best climbing speed you know 50 knots or whatever and that's that's the best that's the best uh, uh, kind of thermal i think for uh, especially for speed to fly if you're trapped in a gaggle with gliders outside you how do you safely get out i don't know i've never been in that situation really even though i've been in competition gaggles with Hundreds and hundreds of, well, all right, not hundred. Well, in one case, there's probably a hundred guys around. Um, but um, you, you just find a gap. And everything that you do, if you're in a big gaggle, needs to be really smooth. And this is a time when if you don't look out, you'll, you'll die. I mean, <laughs> if you don't look out, you will crash into somebody. Or you'll get lots of complaints in the bar because they're looking at you. Um, so you just got to slide out gently and find a gap. But uh, it's so it's so rare that that happens in in general. It, that's generally a competition thing. Thanks for Spain, brilliant. Um, timetable, futures. Ah, thanks, Luke. Yeah, quite right. Thanks very much. Should work. Yeah, that's right. I heard. Uh, George Camp should work in a team in thermals. I heard uh, a competition forum once. Somebody said, um, when you're running, you're competitive. And when you're in a thermal, you're collaborative. So you're trying to get the best out of the thermal when you're actually in a thermal. If there's a few of you there and you're talking on the radio, you're trying to get the best out of that thermal. You're all in the same place. You're all in the same boat. But when you're making the decisions in the, on the run, then that's when you're competitors and you're doing different things. You're trying to trying to go in different places um gary thanks yeah great super netto yeah uh right brilliant i think that'll probably do um so thanks very much if you've got as as i say at the end of all these um please don't just go and try this stuff on your own if you if you don't know what i was talking about whatever go and talk to an instructor and um even at the moment if you don't understand what's going on encourage your club instructors to to do some webinars perhaps if you especially if you didn't understand something that that we that we chatted about um and also um that's my email address mind you uh, i'm actually not going to be answering that soon for a little while um but um if you if you get in quick, tell me what you want me to chat about in the future. Put it on here if you like. Um, and what we should persuade? Uh, what we should persuade? What should we persuade to chat on? Oh, who? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Who should we persuade? Yeah, is there anybody that you would like that you think? Oh, he or she would do a good chat. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I hope they'll they'll come and do one of these. So, yeah, get me on Mikey Gliding, and. Um, and we'll try and arrange it um brilliant stay safe um stay safe when you fly when we're flying back flying again i'm in the middle of writing stuff to try and make it a bit easier and, and sensible for everybody to get back flying so let's hope that day comes fairly quickly and um christ you know i hope we uh, i hope we see each other on an airfield soon um great let's uh, let's let's wrap it up there Thanks very much for, for attending, guys.